Welcome to the Five Week Linguist Show. If you want to learn a language or you teach a language, you've come to the right place. Join Janina each week for tips, resources, and advice for making engaging language learning happen anytime, anywhere. Welcome to the Five Week Linguist Show. This week, I want to share with you my amazing guest, Dr. Tamara Walker. She's doing some amazing work. She's a professor of history, published author. She's published numerous times in The Guardian, and she's got a couple of books coming out with, I believe, Crown next year. Brilliant woman and who's doing amazing work in the world. And uh, I'm just going to let the interview speak for itself. We're going to put some links. Um, She talks about her foundation and the amazing work that she's doing and how we can help out. Again, thank you for listening. Welcome to the Five Week Linguist Show. This week I have a guest who has some amazing projects going on and writing and uh, books and there's so much to talk about. Uh, This is Dr. Tamara Walker, yes? Yep. Okay, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and and your teaching? Sure. And, yeah. yeah, so I am a professor of history. I teach Latin American history at the University of Toronto, and I also co-founded and co-direct a nonprofit called The Wandering Scholar, which mm-hmm. is focused on making international education opportunities accessible to high school students from low-income backgrounds. And those are kind of related pursuits, my my sort of day job and the nonprofit, since I wouldn't have become an historian of Latin America had I not had an early experience of travel in high school when I went to Mexico. And it really changed the course of my life. It led to me studying abroad in college and pursuing the career that I have now. So it's with that in mind that I, along with my partner, Shannon, O'Halloran Keating decided to found this organization to make those experiences available to, to students like us. That's amazing. So um, I believe that you grew up in Colorado. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. did you you did your undergraduate in Colorado and then sort of went? Is that right? Up, up no, up. I did my undergraduate in Philadelphia. I went to the University of Pennsylvania for undergrad. Oh, so nice. from <laughs> the time I turned 18, I, I left home. Okay. And- yeah, has continued to just be away from Colorado. And then, but you also, um, congratulations, that's Ivy League. That's that's quite an accomplishment. Um, you, did you tell me that you studied in Mexico as a high school student? Is that right? And this yeah. is kind of what everything, is, can you tell us about that, please? Yeah, yeah. So I went to this high school that had an interim program is what they called it. Mm -hmm. And it was basically a way to spend spring break doing something productive or constructive. And so students had the chance to either work at a shelter, a homeless shelter or domestic violence shelter to do different types of community service projects to hone their interest in theater or the arts, or if they had taken language classes to study overseas. And so my first year of the program, I was able to go to Mexico, and then I studied French the next year, basically, to be able to go on the class trip to Paris <laughs> and to, to Lyon. So it was through this amazing program that my high school had offered um, that had I not gone to that school and not gotten a scholarship to go to that school, mm-hmm. never would have had those opportunities because I you know, started out at a public school in my neighborhood in Denver that didn't even have language classes, much less these kinds of programs. Really? Yeah, so it just wow. was a completely different world um, and a completely different world of opportunity. And I happened to be able to experience it and and create the life that I have now because of it. So that was very much the idea behind The Wandering Scholar, just sort of recognizing that it's not for lack of ability or interest in these sorts of experiences. Yep. Um, but for lack of opportunities, especially right. for low income students who bring a lot to the experience, too. That yeah. was kind of the idea behind The Wandering Scholar, that we recognized that low income students, many of whom are first generation American or who will be the first generation in their family to go to college, have a resilience and 
life experiences mm-hmm. that only make cross-cultural exchanges richer, that they bring a perspective to their host countries that a lot of students from more privileged backgrounds don't have that allow them to connect with people in their, their host cultures differently and on a deeper level. And so we're very much a, a scholarship program, right, that creates the financial conditions for students mm-hmm. to travel. But part of the understanding is that they also bring something really impressive and powerful to the table. It's not like a an act of charity that is making them have these experiences, but a recognition that they are the exact folks that need to be experiencing these trips and, and representing the U S when they travel. Can I ask, have you, um, do you, have you ever, do you ever speak at any of the, you know, I, I always come to everything with the lens of language, even the language and culture is completely linked. Um, so those are a lot of the organizations that I have a lot to do with, um, mm-hmm. organizations like actful and AATSP where you have a lot of contact with teachers, and um, you, people who would be he, basically huge fans of what you would be doing. You know, I, yeah. I would have been a fan had I known about this before, you know, kind of recently when I, I, I got a chance to read um, this excellent article that you wrote, I wouldn't have known about that. And I, you know, I read all the news, everything that comes to me because I'm really interested in that. And I think that most foreign language teachers are, you know, we want to support this for so many kids. So. Yeah, that's such a good idea. And no, because we had, for our first couple of years, we've been around for 10 years at this point. And for the bulk of our, our life as an organization, we have had partners who kind of promote the work we do mm-hmm. to students who come to them, the travel partners that we work with, um, Smithsonian Student Adventures oh, nice. and um, Where There Be Dragons. And they already kind of have a built-in base of people who are interested in their programs and Usually what happens is that they send students our way who are interested in the programs but can't afford to participate in them. Um, And we've done a little um, more and more each year of recruiting our own students and working with particular schools and particular Mm -hmm. cities. Um, But we're still trying to kind of reach those students who are interested in foreign languages but might not think of travel as something that is in the cards for them right. and convince them that that is something very much that they can take advantage of. And so that's such a great idea just to reach out to the, the teachers that would be able to then put us in touch with the students who we want to apply to our program. You're an outstanding writer and they do publications online both okay. and that outreach to, to teachers. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll send you some links to, to those organizations. Um, what can you tell us about where some some of the students have gone and what some of the projects have been yeah so one of the components of our program is not just that we provide scholarships to students but that we expect that they will create um, what we call documentation projects Mm -hmm. and it's basically a research project that the student takes on in their host country um, with the idea being that they treat their host country as a site of knowledge right and a place that can help them better understand a topic from history or a social issue or something related to food and culture that they're interested Mm in. Um, And so prior to their trip during our pre-departure curriculum, we have the students kind of identify the topic that they're interested in Mm -hmm. and start to think about what they need to know, what they need to read, who they need to talk to in order to carry out their documentation project. Um, Part of the idea for that too is that so much of the youth travel landscape is, or for a long time pre-COVID, was dominated by service travel, where students would take trips to communities where they would participate in community service projects, building playgrounds, um, schools, things like that, um, working in community centers and things of that nature. And, you know, I have critiques of that that model mm-hmm. and And yet that is such a fundamental kind of part of how people and young people especially experience travel. Mm -hmm. And so our thinking behind the documentation project was to add a different kind of element of that relationship. So it's not just that you think of travel as an opportunity to serve other communities, especially considering how complex those issues tend to be, but that you can think of the places you travel as places 
um, as I mentioned, as sites of knowledge, right? As places that have something to teach you and not just this kind of generic notion of people being poor, but happy and things like that, that often <laughs> become the lessons that people take away from those experiences, yeah, yeah. but something deeper and more profound and more, more reflective of a different type of engagement than one yep. that's just focused on service. So with all of that being in the background, we have sent students to Costa Rica, where, for example, one student created recipes based on what her host mother had prepared for oh, her nice. when she stayed with her, <laughs> um, and all the stories that the host mother told about how she learned to cook these things with her mom and her grandma and the occasions they would serve certain meals at. Um, we have sent students to Peru. We had one student who went to Peru and had kind of already been interested in poetry and mm. spoken word poetry. And basically his documentation project was kind of to, to be, it was, you know, it was unstructured and it was basically to kind of be inspired by this place and oh, let nice. his experience kind of shape his art. So he produced a lot of poems around his experience in Peru. Um, and then we more recently last summer, um, which was, the most recent summer of our programming because for obvious reasons we don't have students traveling this summer mm -hmm. we had one student go to peru again for one month and one student go to senegal for one month mm -hmm. and the student who went to senegal is a high school athlete and really interested in soccer so he did a documentation project based on soccer and like the the culture around soccer uniforms mm -hmm. that people wear, you know, for their favorite players and things like that. And the styles that they emulate that their favorite players wear, like their hairstyles and things like uh -huh. that. Um, and then the student who went to Peru did something related to cooking, which is a popular topic um, for our students where they're spending time in people's homes and eating the meals that they, the families make for them. And mm -hmm. it just becomes such a cornerstone of their experiences that they want to then share with people who, can't take the trip for different reasons, like their family members. It's a really cool way of keeping the family and friends and community yeah. they they left behind connected to this travel experience. So those are some of the places that they've gone and the kinds of projects that they can do, um, some of which kind of end up being portable, right, from one region to the next. You can do a cooking project in Costa Rica yeah. and one in Peru, and they'll look very different depending on, you know, what the students' interests are and kind of what the the family makes um but it has been really neat to see how students bring their interest to this kind of this travel experience oh yeah i i when i was a student i that's i i love that idea i love going to language classes definitely you know when you usually when you study language abroad um you know, you might attend university classes, but a lot of them are going to be sort of these language, you're going to go for four hours a day and maybe you study some grammar and some conversation and then you have the rest of the time to go do whatever. But I really like, I really love these kind of projects where people can just really dive into, you know, and dig deep into something that really interests them. So I've always been obsessed with realia. I, I've always been obsessed with realia from countries because it, uh -huh. it seemed to me that you know what i would see in the books in, in my foreign language books were were very you know sort of stereotypical cultural ideas and it was very different what you encountered you know for example going to going to i i love looking at mcdonald's menus even though i'm not a huge fan of mcdonald's because uh -huh. it's a reflection of the local culture you know so yeah. in korea um in south korea they tend to eat the same meals regardless of the time of day so I always, you know, looking at the menus are always very interesting. So, or, or talking to people, I love talking to people. So one of my projects when I was a student in Spain was I lined up all of these interviews of local people who did, and, and I, I asked them all the same, basically the same set of questions. And I wanted a very diverse group of people because I wanted all of these different perspectives. So and it was it was so informative. So I love this idea. I love that starting and I wouldn't have thought of that in high school. I wouldn't have had an opportunity to do that in high school. So I love that. I love what you're doing. With that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think I've mentioned this to you before that when I was a graduate student, I had a Fulbright. Mm -hmm. And I remember being really struck by how kind of homogenous the group of Fulbright scholars I was a part of was. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I had a Fulbright in Peru and they had a gathering of all the people from the Andean region who had Fulbrights. And so there were people from Bolivia, from Ecuador, from Colombia, and they'd all come for this kind of few four day meeting for Fulbrights. And I was the only non-white person in the Mm -hmm. room. And I remember I happened to be seated next to a representative from the Fulbright program in the U S and kind of asked about it. And she attributed that to one, the lack of interest on part of students of color, at Mm -hmm. least from her perspective in the program and these experiences, but also maybe more troubling the lack of qualified applicants from Mm -hmm. her perspective. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot that was wrong with that perspective, especially Mm -hmm. because it kind of assumed an objective measure of quality and qualifications. But having said that, I did recognize in my own experience that it was because I'd gone to high school at a place that created these opportunities for me that allowed me to go to Mexico and helped me immerse myself in ways that made me fluent in Spanish that then I improved upon when I studied abroad in Argentina Mm -hmm. and had a research project that I did there that all of these things kind of made me qualified, right, in their estimation for Mm -hmm. that fellowship. And it was because of opportunities, right? So my thinking was, okay, how do you create these opportunities for people who don't go to the kinds of schools that I went to, yeah. but who nonetheless get those experiences and those opportunities outside of school, especially mm-hmm. given just how underfunded a lot of public schools are yeah. these days, um, so that they can put themselves on the path to whatever their version of the Fulbright is, right? It doesn't have to be that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the model very much was kind of a, a Fulbright for high school students and I to emphasize, it. and that's kind of built in the name, the wandering scholar, right? Yeah. To kind of emphasize that you can also make this an intellectual pursuit and think of yourself as bringing something really special to the experience. Um, Cause I think sometimes just having been a scholarship student myself, that there can be a certain amount of baggage attached to having a scholarship. Mm -hmm. Um, That's in part why we call it a fellowship too, because it kind of says something about the student that goes beyond their kind of financial need and emphasizes their, their own qualifications. Um, And that on top of it all, we're kind of giving them these, these skills and a knowledge base that, well, especially when they go on trips with other students yeah. who are often more privileged than they are because we're sending them on travel programs with partners that serve um, high income students or students from high income families that they're traveling with other students. And already a lot of the students that we serve are students of color mm-hmm. or first generation Americans. So already they're, they're different mm-hmm. than the students that they travel with. And that difference can often lead to feeling insecure and out of place because they don't come from money because they're not part of the dominant group. And so here we're giving them something really special and something that sets them apart in a really meaningful way that makes them leaders where they have done a lot of reading and preparation prior to the trip so that they come kind of knowing a fair amount more than their, their counterparts. And so it just gives them an edge and something to be proud of about their their experience and having received this fellowship in the first place. So um, I think I got away from your question. No, 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 it was all really, no, it's really interesting. And I just thought of another question while you were talking. So um, again, I always, I, I am so biased with my language lens, but I mean, you, they could go to English speaking countries and do this as well, couldn't they? So it's not just yeah. a language experience, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, especially because the the goal is to kind of better understand the culture and to learn something about mm-hmm. the culture. Um, and certainly there are English speaking countries around the world that have cultures that are very different than, than ours. And yeah. that is, yeah, that's, that's really part of our, our goal is to kind of help students understand that we haven't, I mean, Costa Rica is obviously a Spanish speaking country, but a lot of people there speak English. And so that still kind of applies even in, in those places. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of the projects are kind of set up so that they don't have to have language skills if they're not very strong in Spanish or, or French or Wolof, as in the case of the student who went to Senegal so that they can still find ways to communicate and get something out of the experience. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Um, 
So, so how, how would a student, how could, how could more students, I know you, 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 you give a really, um, really personalized experience and you give a lot of attention and time to each student. So I know that it's, you know, it's limited in what you can do for that reason. Um, but how, would, how would, would students have, be able to go to your website and apply would they is that how that would work it would be they could make contact with with you and your co-founder yeah so we um have a website it's um www.thewanderingscholar.org mm -hmm. and we also have social media channels we're on instagram at the wandering scholar and twitter at wander scholar and we usually post the application for our summer program in december of okay. the year before the program takes place um, and we usually announce the recipients of our fellowships in March. We tend to accept just a small number of students given the amount of programming that we offer and the intensity of it. Mm -hmm. um, so usually it's between two and five fellows per summer. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping to start serving more students um, which is both the question of, of funding, but also kind of infrastructure, yeah. um, because we, in addition to providing this pre-departure programming to students, we also pair them with travel mentors mm -hmm. who are adults who have had similar experiences and similar kind of formative experiences mm -hmm. of travel in high school or in college, and who have in different ways incorporated travel into their own professional lives and, and personal lives who can basically embody what a grown up wandering scholar would, would look and sound like. Um, so that means having, having volunteers right. to, to work with these students. So there's, there's a lot of people involved in, in serving our, our wandering scholars. Um, we're also hoping at some point to spread our curriculum to other, other kind of corners to maybe high school programs right. that want to send their students on, on trips. Um, and other travel programs that can implement even for their own students, whether they're receiving scholarship support or not, this kind of, of model. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of the idea to kind of build the number of students that we serve in our own programming and also reach other students through our curriculum. So that's as we enter our 10th year is kind of a, a, a direction we're hoping to go in. Can I ask you, and I know we've talked about this before, but you know, just to, to be really clear, I thought it was really interesting, um, you know, your story about how, how this, how your experience abroad, your language classes, I think, you know, led you to a, an opportunity to, to go abroad and then the going abroad led you to where, what exactly what you're doing right now. So would you, could you just fill in a little bit of the blanks uh, for us if we sure. didn't, you know, you talked about Cuernavaca, I thought that was really interesting. And then that led you to Peru and then the major focus of your research and your studies. Yeah, so in, in high school, it was my sophomore year that I was able to do this program in Mexico, and there was just something about that experience. I had a really amazing Spanish teacher um, who just instilled a love, not only for the language, but for the culture and the literature of the Spanish-speaking world. So I knew that no matter what I did with my life, I wanted to continue to study Spanish um, uh -huh. and Spanish-speaking cultures. So then when I went to college, I majored in Spanish and Latin American studies. Eventually I ended up being a history major, but the idea above all else was to, to study Spanish so that I could study abroad because mm -hmm. I just kind of made all these decisions based on where I could travel. So I <laughs> ended up studying abroad um, in, in Argentina. And in part that was because I was part of a program that wouldn't have allowed me to spend more than a semester. Mm -hmm away from school. So I had this idea that I was going to go back to Mexico for a semester with my college roommate and then do a semester in Spain. But I could only go to one place and what better place, at least in my mind at the time, but the, the so-called Paris of the Americas, which is what Buenos Aires was. Because mm, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. it was kind of a little bit of both things, Europe and Latin America. So I went there and honestly had a really horrible time. Really? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Especially because when I went, um, this was 98, 99, and it was a very particular moment in that country's history where they the hadn't economy. really acknowledged their own history of racism, their history of slavery, of African slavery. So 
I stood out as a black person in, in this place, wow. um, and got stared at a lot and got, um, cat called and a lot of innuendo thrown in my way because there were a lot of assumptions that black people and black women in particular in Argentina were from Brazil and there to work as prostitutes. That was just the kind of default wow. unquestioned assumption. My host mother, who was really lovely and really warm and welcoming, would explain that to me. And she just didn't kind of question that assumption, just the kind of racist and sex sexist assumptions yeah. that were wrapped up in assuming that. Um, so it was really difficult. But what I was also doing there was research. I was part of an undergraduate program and a component of the program I traveled on. It was through Butler University mm -hmm. um, that allowed us to take on independent research projects. And so I did one on um, kind of multicultural education in Argentina. I was just curious to know how people talked about the history of race and racism in Argentina. And what I found was that whenever they talked about racism, they were talking about the U.S., that the U.S. was kind of this model for good reason, because the U.S. has a really dark history of racism and of institutionalized racism and segregation that a lot of places around the world understandably kind of hold up as as a model of of what not to do to your your citizenry um but it was strange to me that in a country that had its own history of anti-semitism um there had been a bombing of a synagogue in mm -hmm. buenos aires i think the year before i got there and i was experiencing racism that it was still this narrative that kind of treated racism as a problem that only existed in the U.S. and not in its own context. So that led me to eventually kind of pursue, I went to graduate school for a PhD in history with mm -hmm. the idea of kind of studying race and racism in Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up changing course and studying the history of slavery in Peru, but now I'm kind of going back to Argentina and thinking about some of the same questions I had when I was an undergraduate, but that was very much the experience, even for as difficult as it was, yeah. that made me want to kind of know more and do more and just do more thinking around these these questions of, of race and, and racism in Latin America. Um, so yeah, so that's what I ended up doing in, in graduate school mm -hmm. and writing a book on slavery in Peru and doing other, other types of, of scholarly inquiry into these subjects but yeah so that's the that's the the long and short of it you brought up an important point though that um as amazing and wonderful as travel is it can be you know aesthetically and to your senses and to your your mind there's also you learn just as much if not more from the types of experiences that you're talking about that you didn't expect to have mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. And yet, you know, for as much as it was really traumatizing in the moment and there were so many times I wanted to go home mm -hmm. <laughs> during my semester there and would call home crying. It was really a powerful experience, in part because it one brought me closer to my grandparents because my grandfather was born in Alabama, mm -hmm. served in the military, had been stationed overseas and had lived in Austria at a point with my grandma and their two oldest kids. Um, and this was in the 1950s. And I remember telling him a story about something that had happened to me on the way to call him. Cause this was in the, the dark ages where we didn't have um, cell phones and <laughs> we had to go to um, these places called locutorios to make phone calls. And so yeah, I was yeah. walking to one. You know, <laughs> so I was, you know, doing what I usually did, which was walk to the one that was in my neighborhood and had a really upsetting experience. So I told my, my grandfather about it when I called home to talk to him and it opened him up to sharing some of his experiences in Austria. He said he remembered that people would ask if they had tales, if black people had tales, um, just based on what they, what little they knew about black people and what they were getting out of the U S in terms of its really offensive depictions of black people in that time. So it brought us closer together. Mm -hmm. Um, and connected me to an experience that I think because I was so young, I would say that grandparents are wasted on young people. Cause like we end up being so self-absorbed that we don't <laughs> yes. always ask them the questions that 
kind of bring us a deeper understanding of where they came from and then History. In turn where we came from. Yeah. Right. So like there was so much about his life that I just didn't know and still don't know. Right. Cause he died um, when I was in graduate school. But in those moments, I really came to understand just what incredible experiences he had. Mm-hmm. And that was something he and I had in common, right? Like he had traveled obviously because of his military career and I was under very different and obviously more privileged circumstances in my travels, but it ended up being a really special part of our relationship, just being able to share our travel experiences together and ask him more about his life overseas. Um, So in that sense, I don't regret any of what I I went through and obviously, you know, set me on the path to my career as well Mm -hmm. and the kind of reading I do outside of my career. Um, And I'm sure we'll get to this, but I am working on a book on the history of African-Americans abroad. Yes. And that very much came out of those early experiences, my personal experiences, my conversations with my grandfather, the recognition that came that our experiences were part of a larger history Mm -hmm. and weren't just individual experiences, but more collective ones. Um, So that's something that I don't think I would have, I don't think I would have had the same relationship to travel and the same kind of thought processes had it it been a more pleasant experience, you know, you don't wish bad things on yourself or on anyone, but so much came out of it that there's no way I would have done anything differently. That's so interesting. I think you're the first person I've ever heard say, you know, I told you that my sort of bucket list trip, you know, I wanted to go to, you know, over to Colonia and to Buenos Aires. And I mean, Mm. it was, I mean, not the best Airbnb and I mean, (laughs) they're just like, oh, this thing that I had wanted to do. And, you know, the last I've had, you know, just, just this, I can't believe this is actually going to happen. And of course it didn't. And, you know, and I still feel very lucky with my circumstances and all of that, but it's just, wow, that's, that's, that's really, it's just not a perspective I would have this is not what I would have imagined somebody, everyone else I know who has, who has tr- studied in Argentina. This is the first time I've heard a story like this. Yeah. So. And I think, it, you know, it was a moment in time too. I went back to Argentina last summer and I had an incredible experience. And in part it was because I understood how different it was yeah. in summer ni- 2019 than it was in summer 1999 in part because there have been so many, there's a lot that's happening internally, but there's also been a lot of um, immigration from West Africa, from Senegal in mm-hmm. particular. Um, and there was already kind of a, a growing awareness on part of um, a lot of people there of their own history and need to kind of reckon with that history. Yeah. Um, so all of that kind of combined to mean that I didn't stand out nearly as much as I had before. Um, wasn't getting stared at in the same way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're also a different person 20 years after you yeah, yeah. kind of experience something. Um, so all of that just made for such a lovely experience. So, um, and again, I don't think I would have appreciated that place either. And like the place that it is now and that it was, you know, last summer, mm-hmm. had I not had the experience I had when so, I was in college. So all of that together has just kind of been meaningful. So for people who would like to, you know, donate, contribute, mentor, we're going to put a link in in the show notes so you can do that. So I think there'll be maybe two separate links. And um, so uh, I know you have a donate URL. You told me about that. And then another one, just the general site. So if people are interested in maybe, you know, know young people who would be interested in this kind of thing or they could, you know, um, perhaps contribute through mentorship or. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I was just going to add to that the mentorship angle, because I know that especially in our current moment, you know, people have a lot of financial concerns and Mm -hmm. and worries and no one can travel anyway. So it's hard to get people (laughs) too enthusiastic (laughs) about contributing to an organization that's focused on on travel. But we we do very much believe in our mission and, and have over the past 10 years really served students in in ways that have changed the course of their lives we've had students go on to study abroad in india and hong kong and uh, israel and major in arabic and Mm -hmm. other uh, other fields um go on to graduate study and we we know and they've told us how essential 
this experience was to setting the course of their lives. Um, and these are the exact people we want traveling and representing the U.S. Um, and the best of who we are and staying engaged. So the, no amount is too small and, and too meaningless for the, the work that we do. But also, aside from financial support, we always are looking for mentors to work with our students, especially people who hear the name The Wandering Scholar and hear what we do and connect it to their own early experiences. Mm -hmm. um, those are the best mentors because those are people who will be able to to show our students exactly what can come of their experience in high school because they're the the kind of 20 years later version yeah. of, or even 10, 15 years later, right? We, we also welcome younger mentors who are early career and fresh out of college. Um, but it's just a really meaningful part of the work that we do is to connect our students to adults who can show them what to do with this experience after they have it mm -hmm. and before they have it, right? What, how best to take advantage of it, how to prepare for it, what to buy a host family as a gift, things like yeah. that. So yeah. we also welcome, and I'll, I'll include the link um, so that you can put that in the episode notes because I think that's a really fun arena to be involved in and doesn't oh, cost yeah. anything but time. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. So your books, let's, let, I want to hear all about, I'm, this is so exciting. You've got two exciting book projects. One is coming out sooner than the other, of course. Could you, could you talk about that please? Yeah. So one is purely academic and it was the reason I went to Argentina um, last summer because I'm doing a book on race, gender, and visual culture in Latin America, mm -hmm. just depictions of people of African descent and art from the colonial period to the present day. Um, so Argentina is one of the case studies I use for that book, but the travel book that I'm working on is called the global green book. It's going to be published by crown. Um, and it's basically a character driven narrative history of African Americans living and working abroad over the course of the, the past hundred years, basically starting with figures that are familiar to us, like Josephine Baker, when she was in Paris in the 1920s to people who are lesser known, but who had really meaningful, powerful experiences um, at different points in, in their personal history and in U.S. history that are really illustrative of, of important kind of trends and, and phenomena. Um, so each chapter is about a particular person, a place in the world, and a, a decade of the 20th and 21st century. Um, and that, you know, it, it's an extensively researched book, so it requires time. Mm -hmm in archives and overseas that has kind of been put on hold with the, because all of, of this. COVID. <laughs> yeah. So it'll, it'll come out a little later than, than I hoped, but it's still very much um, a, a fun project to, to take on, to just spotlight people and experiences that we don't talk enough about, but yeah. they are a big part of, of not just African American, but even U S history, right. That it says a lot about the U S that so many people, felt the need and the, the, the call to, to leave the U S right. at different points. And so this green guide, so, so you told me about it. So it's, it's places that are essentially identified a collection of, you know, people would say, this is a good place. This is a safe place. This is a good place to stay from all over the world, right? That they put this together. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the title of the Global Green Book is kind of a play on the Green Book, which was a collection of guides, as you mentioned, that mm -hmm. dated back to the 1930s when a man named Joseph Green started to, he was a mail carrier and had spent time traveling and having really traumatic experiences of traveling within the U.S. where he was pulling up to hotels that would turn him away yeah. because he was black or road stops, uh, rest stops, restaurants, things of that nature. So what he did was collect a set of a list of places where black motorists, it was called the Negro motorist green book where black motorists driving around the U S would be able to consult and know that they would be welcome at these hotels and restaurants and yeah. rest stops. Um, and the reason I kind of append the global to it is one, a nod to the history of the green book guides, because beginning in the 1950s, the, Global Green Book, or the, pardon me, the Green Book would focus on international destinations. Mm -hmm. um, 
kind of concurrent with the jet age, they started to talk about places like Mexico, the Caribbean, Europe. So there had always been, at least in the kind of the, the life of this, this green book and in the history of African-American travelers, a global bent. And so what the, the title of my book does is kind of acknowledge that history, both within the green book itself and within the African-American kind of traveling tradition that it wasn't just confined to the U.S., that it was always kind of focused outward um, for reasons that we can imagine, right, mm-hmm. that people were seeking opportunities overseas that they couldn't find in the U.S., seeking comforts and and freedoms and, and dignity that they couldn't find in the mm-hmm. U.S. So it's meant to kind of capture capture all of those things. Wow, so interesting. Um, thank you so much. This has been so informative. Thank you. I'm so excited to read your book. By the way, I can't. I can't wait to sometime next year, right? You know, I know all the dates. Everything has been. This pandemic is really. Everything seems to be up in the air right now. So yeah, yeah. So I guess if we're lucky, late 2021, but most likely early 2022. But I'll be happy to come back and chat with you. When Excellent. It goes yes, yes, yes. Please yeah. do. Thank you so much, Tamara. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Five Week Linguist Show with Janina Klimas. Join us each week here and visit us at reallifelanguage.com slash reallifelanguageblog for more resources for learning and teaching languages.